Okay, thank you very much everyone for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jonathan Maudsley. I am the Science Advisor of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, which is uh, one in a series that's sponsored by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies in partnership with our good friends at the U.S. Forest Service Research and Development Group. Today's webinar is entitled Long-Term Research to Document Effects of Elk nutrition and predation on mule deer populations. We'll be hearing from Mike Wisdom, research wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service, Darren Clark from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Mary Rowland, who is a research wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service. But before we start with today's webinar, I wanted to give a few um, house take take care of a few housekeeping details before we get started. First and foremost, the webinar is being recorded. It will be displayed on a new AFWA website as soon as we have that up, website up and running. In the meantime, if you'd like to reach out to Monica Thomas here or myself, we'd be happy to share you uh, the link where you can find the webinar recording on the web. Second, as you can hear, there is often a lot of extraneous noise on these webinar conference calls. And so what we'll be doing right after Monica Thomasy from the Forest Service introduces our speakers today in today's topic, I will be muting all the lines and then bringing up the speakers so that we can hear the speakers more clearly. What this means is that you won't be able to ask questions during the middle of the webinar. So what we ask is that if you do have a question and you'd like to ask a question of one of our speakers today, please use the chat box, which you'll see in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And I'll be prompting you uh, as we go through the webinar, reminding you that you are certainly welcome to ask questions using the chat box. And depending on how time uh, uh, how much time we have left at the end of the webinar, we'll be going through the questions in the ch starting with those uh -huh. in the chat box, and then if we have additional time, Interrupt. we may go to a Q and a traditional Q&A session on the line. So thank you all very much for joining us for this afternoon's call. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my co good friend and colleague, Monica Thomasy from the U.S. Forest Service, to introduce today's speakers. Monica. Thank you, Jonathan, and thanks for the <clears throat> opportunity to to connect the biologists and the managers with some more of the work we do in Forest Service Wildlife and Fisheries Research Program for the wildlife and fish management community. Welcome, everyone. Through this AFWA webinar series, we're able to address many questions the state and other biologists have about scientific information on topics of current concern and learn who is doing which kinds of scientific research and scientific information delivery. Today's topic was requested due to increasing interest in understanding mule deer population decline. In response, today we're sharing some elements of the mule deer environment that might explain some of the trends and shed light on options for management. For about three decades, Forest Service and state agency scientists, biologists, and managers have collaborated on applied research on elk and deer responses to management, grazing, recreation, and define management strategies across the western United States. Known as the Starkey Project, it received the Boone and Crockett Club Conservation and Stewardship Award in, in 2015 in recognition of decades of long-term research and applied science. Today we have three speakers. Mike Wisdom is a research wildlife biologist with the Pacific Northwest Research Station in La Grande, Oregon, where he leads the Starkey Ungulate Ecology Team. Mike is focused on landscape research on ungulates and species of conservation concern in the western U.S. in the past 25 years. Currently, he's involved with riparian restoration research for threatened salmonids and effects of ungulates on restoration and with mule deer research to understand the reasons for the long-term decline. In 2011, Mike received the Olaf Neary Award from Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation for his long-term contributions to research and management to benefit elk and elk habitat. Mary Rowland is a research wildlife biologist on the Starkey Ungulate Ecology Team. She's worked for more than 20 years on ungulate habitat relationships, especially in relation to human disturbance. Her research interests include modeling resource selection for a variety of species, applying umbrella concepts to species conservation, and broad-scale analysis of habitat threats for terrestrial species of concern. Other work includes applying concepts of viability under the new Forest Service planning rule, and practical approaches for standardized 
wildlife management or wildlife habitat monitoring. And lastly, Darren is a wildlife research project leader for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. His research background is focused on estimating demographic parameters and growth rates of wildlife populations. His previous research investigated carnivore ecology and the effects of predators on prey populations. He's currently leading research on mule deer, elk, their habitats, and predators. Thank you very much. Take it away. All right, we're going to mute all the lines and then bring the speaker lines back up so you don't have extraneous noise. Hold on one second. The conference has been muted. All done our jobs trying okay. to. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Mike, Darren, and Mary, are you there? Yes. Can Very you hear good. Us? Take it away. Yes. So this is Mike Wisdom. Uh, Mary, Darren, and I have put this presentation together, but it what came from an earlier presentation uh, that Darren had put together for a while outside of presentation. And so we thought, for the sake of efficiency, that we would just let Darren uh, take it away and take the lead on presentation. But all three of us are here to. To, to partake in the discussion um, afterwards. Thank you. Oh. All right, uh, so this is going to be a broad talk sort of covering our research objectives and our longer term plan to study um, the Kalyan yield their populations um, with our research focused at the Dark Experimental Forest and Range. Um, it's going to be pretty light on results, um, focus more on uh, sort of the broad objectives, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we, next slide, please. So, <clears throat> mule deer are widely distributed across Western North America, um, and most states have pretty healthy mule deer populations, but we have been seeing declines across, across a wide range of habitats. Um, you can see on that figure there on the right, the text is pretty hard to see, but um, mule deer do inhabit a wide range of habitats, and these declines appear to be pretty universal across their range. Um, Trying to identify these factors is really important for the long-term uh, conservation and management of the species. Next slide. So, <clears throat> mule deer populations peaked in the 1930s, and this was probably attributable to changes in vegetation patterns where we had increasing shrublands, um, which served as good foraging habitat for mule deer. And in the early 1900s, hundreds, mule deer were the most common uh, big game species in Western North America. Population declines have been observed uh, nearly range-wide during the last third of the 20th century. And in the 23 states where uh, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, monitors population trends, um, most populations are below management objectives. Some states are still observing declining populations, but most have stabilized, um, but well below historic levels. And WAFO established the Mule Deer Working Group um, almost 20 years ago in a recognition of this decline, and this group's been really important in helping understand some of the reasons that Mule Deer populations might be declining. Um, next slide. So if we scale it a bit and look at Oregon, um, the figure on the left shows uh, distribution of Mule Deer summer range habitat, so that lighter sort of green color um, represents uh, summer range, so we've got pretty good distribution of summer range throughout eastern Oregon. And the graph on the right is Oregon's estimated mule deer population from the 1980s until 2015. Uh, over this window, we've seen about a 20% decline in the mule deer population in Oregon, and our population is currently about 40% below our management objective. Next slide. So WAFWA and some other people have proposed several hypotheses for why mule deer may be declining. And Here's just some of the compelling hypotheses that could be occurring. There are other ones here, but there's things related to declining quality of or quantity of winter range, um, inadequate nutritional resources, whether this be on winter range or summer range. Um, carnivore populations have increased from historic lows in the 1960s, and we have more species and higher densities across the landscape in Western North America. There could be over harvest or poaching issues or other human caused mortality issues. Climate change could be a factor along with competition with other ungulates, including elk, um, domestic livestock, and uh, white-tailed deer. 
And disease is another issue, uh, particularly, say, chronic wasting disease in portions of mule deer range that could be affecting mule deer populations. Next slide, please. And so the ones that are still sort of the uh, lighter color here are ones that we're going to try and get at with some of our research at Starkey. Uh, so primarily looking at nutritional resources, predation, and then competition with ungulates, uh, specifically elk. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the reasons we wanted to look at competition with elk is in sharp contrast to our mule deer population, our elk population in Oregon has increased by about 65% since the early 1980s. And so this strong increase of a dominant competitor might be having a negative effect on our mule deer populations, and this could be the case in other uh, western states and provinces. Next slide, please. So research conducted at the Stark External Forest as part of the Starkey project has indicated that there is evidence of competition uh, between mule deer and elk. Uh, we've seen strong dietary overlap between the two species, and there's a spatial compression of mule deer distributions by elk, and there appears to be suboptimal habitat choices and habitat use occurring uh, by mule deer in the presence of elk. And we've also seen a long-term decline in our Starkey mule deer population, um, as the elk population in Starkey has also increased. And so what we're trying to get at here now is whether there is a population level effect of increasing elk populations on mule deer. And the lower text on the bottom, some of the papers that have been published um, looking at competition between these species and including cattle. Um, so if you have some interest, you can pull the slide up later. Um, and we can also get these publications to people if they have interest. Uh, next slide, please. So it's pretty expensive that we have observed elk population increases in Oregon and throughout much of the western United States. And we do know that elk and mule deer are direct competitors with dietary overlap, they share habitat, and deer do tend to avoid elk on the landscape. But what we don't know is if there is a population level response or is the mule deer population actually declining due to competition with elk. Next slide, please. So there's a couple ways to try and get at this competition question. Um, we could try and do an observational study where we monitor um, mule deer population demographic parameters across a range of elk densities. Uh, one of the issues with trying to take this approach is you're, well, it's logistically challenging to be spread that far across the landscape. But there's also other confounding factors such as differences in habitat between study areas, uh, different climate regimes, and other factors that are harder to control for um, when you're looking at multiple study areas. The other appealing option is to do a controlled experiment um, where you would manipulate elk populations and look at the response of mule deer. In most places, this is incredibly difficult to do, um, to try and do it at a large enough spatial scale to actually affect uh, the whole elk population that resides in the area and measure the response in the mule deer population. Um, next slide, please. But fortunately for us, uh, we do have a study area where we can direct, directly manipulate uh, elk populations, and this is at the Starkey Experimental Forest and Range. Um, the study area here is surrounded by an ungulate-proof fence, um, and this does allow us to directly manipulate the size of the elk population. Our main study area where most of the research occurs, um, sort of the orange color on the figure on the right, is about, uh, about 30 square miles. And then we have another northeast study area where we do density manipulation of elk and look at vegetation response. And then the other smaller areas are part of the winter, winter handling facilities where we're able to handle elk and collar them. The Stark Experimental Forest and Range is pretty typical of most of the dry interior forests in the Blue Mountains, um, so it's pretty representative of the surrounding area. It has moderate elevation and general rolling topography. Next slide, please. So a, a bit more background on the Starkey Project. Um, it was initiated in 1989 um, to look at the main emphasis is looking at management activities on elk and mule deer. Uh, since its inception, this has been a uh, collaborative effort between Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Pacific Northwest Research Station. Um, and over the, the time since 1989 to present, we've had over 80 plus federal, state, private, university, and tribal partners participate in our research and collaborate with us. And we've completed over 80 studies, and, which has resulted in over 400 publications. As I mentioned before, the focus is on long-term manipulative experiments that are not feasible elsewhere. Um, having that game-proof fence up allows us to do things 
um, that just aren't feasible on a larger scale. And we've had several key findings come out of the project over time um, that has directly influenced uh, policy and land management and management of ungulate populations, um, not just in Oregon, but throughout the uh, western United States. And this relates to anything from roads to cattle, um, thermal cover, silvicultural activities, um, effects of herbivory on plants, and also looking at land management activities such as fuel and fire uh, management. Next slide, please. So our current ungulate populations in the Starkey Spinal Forest, um, we have this winter we had about 500 elk in our main study area, and that's up from about 350 elk in the uh, mid-2000s. Our current density of elk is about 6.4 elk per kilometer squared, and that'd be on summer range habitat, and which is quite a bit higher than what we observe at other places in the Blue Mountains currently. Um, our mean density without the Blue Mountains, which are in Northeast Oregon, is about 1.6 elk per kilometer squared, and the range, uh, depending on the area, goes from about 0.25 to 4.2 elk per kilometer squared. So we have a pretty high density elk population inside the experimental forest right now. And our mule deer population um, has been declining. We currently have about 120 mule deer, and that's down from about 275 in the early 1990s um, when the Starkey project uh, was initiated. Our current density is about 1.5 deer per kilometer squared on summer range, and the mean density in the Blue Mountains is about 4.7. Um, so we're seeing fewer deer, density of deer inside the experimental forest and outside, but we are within the range observed throughout uh, the Blue Mountains. Uh, next slide, please. So our approach with our current research is to do a controlled experiment, and our, we're currently in phase one, which is our pre-treatment phase, and what we're trying to do here is monitor three key components um, that we see might be influencing mule deer population. And that's just basic demography, so we're going out estimating bond and dose survival and pregnancy rates. We're also looking at mule deer nutrition, trying to understand nutritional resources available to mule deer and how they might be using these in the presence of pretty high density elk populations. And then we're also um, trying to estimate effects of predation and how this might be influencing mule deer population dynamics. Next slide, please. In phase two, we will go into our treatment phase, and our plan is to reduce the elk population inside the experimental forest by approximately 70%, which would leave us about 150 elk in our main study area. And we continue to do post-treatment research for five to six years and monitor the same things that we've been collecting um, pre-treatment. And so, again, those three components are mule deer demography, uh, nutrition and habitat use, and then looking at the predator communities and densities and effects of predation. Next slide. And broadly, these are our larger research questions that we have. Um, and through the controlled experiment, we'll be able to get it uh, before and after responses to mule deer. So we want to look at things like do mule deer use habitat um, that elk previously prevented them from using due to competitive exclusion? And does this result in higher body conditions and pregnancy rates? and survival of mule deer. Um, if they have better access to higher quality habitat due to elk no longer being as high densities, these are the things we should expect to see um, from an increased population performance um, from a bottom-up standpoint. Uh, we're also looking at the top-down part of this, so what role does predation play in mule deer population dynamics? Um, and any ungulate study you need to also key in on both the bottom-up and top-down forces to really get a good understanding of the true dynamics. And ultimately, the thing we want to find out is does reducing the elk density actually result in a population level increase of mule deer? Um, so looking at all the individual components of demography, so survival and pregnancy rate, body condition, does that actually translate to an increased population level of mule deer? Next slide, please. So I'm going to kind of go through each of the components here and how we're collecting the data um, and what sort of things we're looking at. So one of the key things we're looking at is winter nutrition. So some of mule deer and Starkey voluntarily enter the winter feed ground where they are supplementally fed all winter, and then other mule deer do voluntarily stay out in our main study area and are not supplementally fed. And so one of the key things we're going to look at is the pregnancy and survival rates of does and their bonds. Um, that are fed are higher than those that stay out in our main study area and are not supplementally fed all winter. 
And if we are seeing a difference, this may suggest that winter range or winter uh, habitat might be limiting for mule deer populations and be contributing to some of the dec declines we're observing. Next slide, please. We're also looking at summer nutrition, um, which is a key factor influencing body condition of these animals entering winter and also determines whether they're going to get pregnant um, during the rut. And so one of the key things we're trying to do is develop maps of nutritional resources available to mule deer within Starkey. So this involves actually going out and clipping vegetation and measuring the quality and quantity of forage on the landscape and developing a predictive map from that information. And, but then we also want to tie that into if mule deer habitat use, if they're optimally using the landscape and getting these areas of higher quality forage, and if this ultimately influences their body condition going into winter, and if that ultimately influences their own survival and survival of their fawn the following year. And the other thing is part of the manipulative experiment, we'll look at before and after to see if mule deer change their response and if elk are excluding them from areas of higher quality um, nutritional resources on the landscape. Next slide, please. And so this is a hypothetical example of what we're trying to develop here, just ranking the landscape um, from poor to high quality forage conditions or nutritional, uh, anyway, the degree to which the high quality forage is spatially represent the landscape. And so what we want to assess with this is you know, are mule deer in the presence of high density elk populations currently restricted to using, say, these yellow or red areas on the map, which are fair to poor quality nutritional resources. And after the elk are reduced, if they start to expand out and start using the excellent to good areas uh, to a higher degree, if that ultimately influences their fitness level. Next slide, please. So we, every year at Sarka, we do uh, capture and handle mule deer and place GPS collars on them. And so we will be looking at just general habitat use to developing resource selection functions of mule deer over time. And comparing um, our pre-treatment data with high density elk populations to habitat use following the reduction. And as I mentioned also, we're going to look at whether they're shifting their use of the nutritional landscape in response to changes in elk density. And really trying to get if elk are competitively excluding mule deer um, from preferred habitats, which is resulting in uh, reduced body condition and potentially survival. Next slide, please. So the other key thing we're trying to do, since we are trying to get a population level response of mule deer, is monitoring demographic parameters. So we do capture and place GPS collars on a subset of the does every winter, usually about 25 to 30 individuals. Uh, this will get us information on habitat use, but also get us survival and cause specific mortality. And we're also assessing uh, body fat levels or nutritional condition of these does when they are captured entering winter um, to determine if that influences their survival or the survival of their fawns. So any does that are captured um, in December or January and they are pregnant at the time of capture are fitted with a vaginal implant transmitter, um, which is used to help locate and collar fawns uh, during parturition the next year. And by collaring the fawns, again, we're getting survival and cause specific mortality information. Next slide, please. And to date, uh, we've collected three years of pretreatment data and we're in the process of collecting our fourth year. And so we're, we have three years of data analyzed and uh, we'll actually provide some of those results here. Next slide. So we do have uh, almost four years of adult survival mortality and this includes a sample of 42 individual mule deer. Um, some of those are recaptured multiple years. Across the four years we've collected data, we've had 13 um, does die. Predation is the primary cause of mortality that we've observed, um, ranging from coyotes, uh, one black bear predation event, and two cougars. And then we had six die of unknown causes. Um, and usually those were ones we arrived to a little bit late to determine the exact cause of death. They'd either been killed by a predator or scavenged, and we didn't have enough information to accurately determine a cause of death. Next slide, please. And Here's our annual survival rates that were um, calculated for the first four years of the study. Um, note in 2017, 
That's the survival estimate through February. Um, that's when we conducted the analysis and we'll update this at the end of the biological year, which will be uh, May 31st. Um, but we're seeing pretty consistent survival rates between years, except this last year we're going to be a bit lower. We've had additional does die um, after February. And what we see in our survival models is that um, survival is lower during years with increased snow depth, which is primarily this 2017 data set. Um, we had probably two to three times more snow this year than we did in previous years. But in general, our survival rates are a bit lower than observed historically uh, throughout the Western, Western North America. Uh, typically, you see those survival closer to about 85% in stable or increasing populations. Um, so our survival rate is a bit lower um, than what has been historically observed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for fawn survival, this is, includes three years of data. Um, we've collared 66 individual fawns over the first three years of the study. Of those, 48 have died, um, primarily from predation, um, with the suite of carnivores we have present um, contributing in fairly even amounts, uh, but black bears are a bit lower than coyotes and felids, which includes uh, bobcats and cougars. Uh, we've seen some disease issues, so five individuals dying from disease, and most of those occurred within the first 30 days of life. Uh, we had one fawn that was abandoned. We did have two fawns that were uh, trampled to death by elk, um, and then we had 14 mortalities where we were unable to determine a cause of death. Next slide, please. So we've looked at survival in two ways so far. We've estimated survival out to 120 days, and this is when the bulk of the mortality occurs. Out to 120 days, our survival rate is about 34%. Um, we aren't seeing any differences between years. But we did see an effect of supplemental feeding, um, where fawns born to females that received supplemental feed during winter had higher survival rates. And again, this may be suggesting there's some uh, winter nutritional limitations going on, at least in this population. Next slide, please. And we've also looked at juvenile survival at 226 days, um, sort of an odd day to stop on there, but that is basically due to small sample size, we restricted that. But after data collection through this winter, we should be able to get out to uh, estimated survival to one year of age. But out of 226 days, our survival rate is uh, 21%, um, which is pretty low compared to um, some historic data and then some other areas in the west, in Western North America. As is pretty common with uh, neonate ungulate data, um, we are seeing increasing survival from birth as they age. Uh, probably risk of predation goes down and risk to other cause mortality such as disease also decline as they age. And similar to the doe survival, we did see decreased fawn survival during years with increased snow depth. And as I mentioned before, that's largely driven by our 2017 data um, this past winter, which uh, was a part of winter that we'd observed uh, several years out in the experimental forest. Next slide, please. So using the information um, that we have so far, if you plug those numbers into a deterministic Leslie matrix model, so using dose survival rate of about 80%, uh, estimated yearly survival rate about 70%, 21% annual fawn survival and a fecundity rate of 0.75. Um, our lambda is a little bit less than 0.9, uh, which indicates we currently have a declining uh, mule deer population within the experimental forest. Uh, and we will continue to update this as we move along to see um, how this trajectory changes, and particularly in response to the reduction in elk densities. And this will be one of the key ways we get at whether there is actually a population level response in mule deer. Next slide, please. So with our mule deer demography data, we're going to continue to collect pretreatment data for another two to three years. Um, the main reason for doing this is to account for some of that environmental variability. Um, so we can assess things like harder winters on mule deer demographics. And one of the key things we hope to do, um, pending future funding, is try and expand some of our efforts outside but adjacent to the experimental forest. And the goal here is to try and get a control population. So when we actually experimentally reduce the elk populations by start eat, we have some baseline data outside 
um, where the elk population is not being drastically manipulated to see if there are trends we, any trends we might see and changes in demographic parameters um, are actually due to our control of reducing the elk population uh, by about 70 percent. And so we're going to initiate the elk density reduction in probably two to three years and we will continue to monitor the same mule deer demographic parameters and also nutritional condition of those um, pre and post treatment. And ultimately we will compare these pre and post treatment results to see if there is a population level response of mule deer to the elk density reduction. Next slide please. So usually can't get away studying ungulate population dynamics without studying carnivores and we are going to be doing that at the experimental forest. Um, this will be the first time we've actually collected um, any substantial carnivore data at the experimental forest to try and relate back to ungulate populations. Currently, uh, we do have four of these five carnivores present inside the experimental forest. Uh, so black bears, cougars, bobcats, and coyotes are all resident uh, within the experimental forest. Wolves are recently uh, colonizing northeast Oregon and expand their distribution. Um, we have gotten some trail cam photos of a collared GPS, uh, GPS collared wolf that is periodically entered the experimental forest but has not spent much time there. Um, so to our knowledge, we currently don't have an existing wolf population that would be influenced as a result, but that could happen down the road. Next slide, please. So one of the key things we want to do with uh, our carnival research at Starkey is get uh, quality density estimates that we can try and see if variation in carnivore populations over time influences fawn or adult doe survival. Um, within the experimental forest. And estimating carnivore populations is notoriously difficult due to their elusiveness and low densities on the landscape. So we're trying to also develop just some techniques that will be broadly applicable um, throughout Western North America uh, to try and estimate carnivore populations. And we're primarily going to try and get this through non-invasive sampling. Um, so we're going to use scat detecting dogs this spring uh, to collect carnivore scat that will be genotyped and then we'll do a genetic mark recapture analysis uh, to provide a uh, estimate of densities within the experimental forest. But we're also, as part of research, we're also collaring um, all of these four species of carnivores and we're going to try and use some camera mark recite, camera traps to do mark recite techniques and determine which of these techniques is most precise and accurate. Um, and then use that information to look at effects of carnivores on mule deer populations. Next slide, please. And we're also trying to look at habitat use of all four of these carnivore species. Um, so we're putting GPS collars on bobcats, coyotes, cougars, and black bears. And one of the key things we also want to look at is this habitat use of carnivores, or which from the mule deer side would be viewed as risk of predation, does that influence how mule deer are using the landscape? And again, that ties back into some of the mule deer nutrition mapping we'll be doing and seeing if presence of carnivores actually excludes mule deer from actually accessing some of their higher quality forage resources that they might want to get at, or if these areas might be um, good nutritionally for mule deer, but they might also have the highest risk of mortality and somehow mule deer have to reach that balance of nutritional resources and risk of predation um, to optimize their fitness level. And a bit independent of some of the mule deer work is we're also trying to look at how carnivores interact with each other in the landscape and if they competitively exclude each other and how their use of the landscape and potential for competitive exclusion uh, influences their ability to prey upon mule deer and ultimately influence mule deer populations. Next slide, please. And one of the other benefits of uh, collecting a lot of this information on carnivores is on many of these species, uh, black bears, bobcats, and coyotes particularly, um, we're simply lacking some of the basic species-specific information in Oregon. So things on home range or territory size, survival rates, and diet um, are lacking in our area. And so collecting this will be just good baseline information to help manage these species also. And Next slide, please. And so here we've got our, uh, this is a complicated figure of our interpretation of how the world works, at least as far as ungulates go. Uh, 
So there's lots of things going on here. As the exact details aren't terribly important, but effectively at the top we're dealing with um, sort of top-down, what bottom-up forces. We have it sort of backwards here. Um, so things like climate, how that influences uh, vegetation, how these vegetation patterns then influence habitat use and nutritional condition of both deer and elk. And then there's interactions between deer and elk. And then if you come from the bottom end, we're looking at top-down forces such as human harvest um, and space use and predation, use of the landscape by predators, and then their direct predation effects on cause specific mortality and how that ties into survival rates and recruitment of fawns. So this is lots of things going on here. Um, next slide, please. And so we're trying to do our best to try and fill in all these holes to identify which of these factors are having the largest effect on mule deer population dynamics and also on elk uh, dynamics. So all the things that are still highlighted in, that are highlighted in dark blue, um, those are things we are currently collecting information on as part of this mule deer research. Um, and then the things that are in green are historic data sets that we collect at Starkey and are continuing to collect. Um, and this will all ultimately work into a larger synthesis of us trying to understand how um, ecosystem processes play out with large ungulate populations. And then the sort of brown ones are ones we're still not directly collecting a lot of information on, but in time we will probably have uh, more of this information to continue to move through. Um, next slide, please. So the past figure was sort of more complex because sort of that's our simplified view of reality, um, and this is a bit even more simplified, more related just to our current mule deer research. And so we have this sort of broken out into a few different boxes. So we have our carnivore component, elk, directly competition with elk, but then how this influences mule deer habitat use, mule deer nutrition, and mule deer population dynamics. Um, next slide, please. And so the key thing for us here is to determine how these things link together and what the strength of these interactions are between um, each of these different boxes. And ideally, we'll be getting some of this larger synthesis work in the next probably five to ten years um, after we wrap up most of our major data collection on part of this project. But as the Starkey project has such a long historic data set, um, we should be able to really get some quality answers and really understand how some of these dynamics play out um, to influence mule deer population dynamics. And next slide, please. And so we should end up having plenty of time for questions here. Um, we wanted to leave a bit of time just for some general discussion at the end. Uh, but this is a very large collaborative research project um, with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and U.S. Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station uh, played a large role. But we also uh, work directly with universities, and we're working with the University of Idaho, University of Nevada, Reno, and Oregon State University as part of our current mule deer research. And with that, we can open up to questions if there are any. Great. Thank you very much for that terrific presentation, Darren, Mike, and Mary. We really appreciate you sharing this information with the audience. You've got a really great audience today, and we do have a number of questions that have come in in the chat box. I just want to call everyone's attention. First and foremost, Jim Heffelfinger at, associated with the Western Mule Deer Working Group has sent a couple of links. I'm not sure if they're showing up for everyone, but the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies has uh, latest status of mule deer in the West, as well as uh, a fact sheet on deer elk competition issues. It's available on the WAFWA website, www.wafwa.org, and I invite folks to look at those if you inter have further interest in these areas. Our first question here, though, is from Joe Gergen, who is with Safari Club International Foundation. He's curious as to how Boone and Crockett is involved and wants to know how Safari Club might be able to be involved as well in this research. Uh, this is Mike Wisdom, and the Boone and Crockett Club has been a long-term partner in the Starkey research and has uh, helped um, with input from their, their board and their members on the design of this research and has really helped try to go out and find and secure funding among a lot of different partners. So they've, they've been involved a long time. Um, we do have, uh, obviously, some big challenges in trying to maintain this long-term data stream to really complete this project. That's one of our biggest challenges. And 
uh, any of the hunting conservation groups, uh, we would welcome any discussion about how uh, more resources could be um, directed to, to help maintain that uh, data stream because obviously, especially in, in the Forest Service these days, uh, our, our budgets are down, they continue going down, so we, we really do try to partner up with lots of different interested um, groups, including uh, Safari Club would be fantastic to, to partner on this if there's interest. Great, very good. We're happy to facilitate any of those conversations through AFA, or please feel free to follow up directly. A uh, question here from uh, Eric Abelson. I'm curious about the temporal scale of habitat use assessment. What will the fix rate be for deer and pre versus predator GPS collars? Uh, this is Darren. Um, our fix schedules vary a bit by species. I believe we have all of our carnivore collars sampling on a two and a half hour interval, I believe, um, so we can get some rotation through um, sampling different periods of the day um, over time. Our deer and elk collars have 90 minute fix rates um, for the main part of this research. Um, some of our other research, the fix rates get bumped up for some of our hunting related research, um, but we can subsample back down to have that 90 minute fix rate throughout the year. Great, thank you. Question here from John McLaughlin. How will you reduce the elk numbers? Capture, relocation, hunter harvest? Uh, this is Darren again. Um, we'll primarily rely, hopefully rely on hunter harvest, um, but with the understanding that we want to do this reduction in short a time frame as possible. And we're probably looking at maybe trying to do harvest over two years, and if we do not um, achieve our objective through hunter harvest, we will then um, capture elk off the winter feed ground when they come in and haul them out of the experimental forest um, into adjacent wildlife management units. This is Mary. Just an additional note to that. That's one um, great advantage of Starkey with the hunters because there's basically one main gate and so we get a lot of population data from harvested animals and, and hunters themselves. So it's a, a really good way not only to offer hunters the opportunity to harvest instead of us just trucking them out or something, but we can also get a lot of really good biological data. Great. Thank you. Question here from Adam Grove. Do you currently have mule deer summer range nutrition quality information or some correlate information such as body fat or body condition of does going into the winter? Uh, this is Darren, I, I'll just keep answering. Uh, we are collecting the body condition information as part of our capture operations every winter on mule deer. Um, so we have that information. And we, our grad student at University of Idaho is uh, entering her second field season, um, going out and sampling vegetation uh, to get at uh, quantity and quality of uh, forage species on the landscape. And then we'll be producing nutritional maps of the landscape within Starkey as part of that, of her master's work. Um, one of our larger goals down the road is to potentially um, expand that effort across a wider range of habitat types throughout the Blue Mountains so we can develop nutritional maps there and with the potential of some of these being useful um, to areas outside of Oregon also, or at least laying a framework of a good sampling approach to map nutritional resources for mule deer across larger landscapes. Great, thank you. Question from Chris Loggers. Are you aware of mule white-tailed deer nutritional ecology project it's being done uh, by Washington State University Shipley in conjunction with the Colville National Forest. There might be opportunity to tie in with the researcher on some nutritional insights. This is Mike Wisdom. I, I'm, I guess we are aware of that work and uh, we think it's very important. And uh, one thing that uh, we didn't really cover is at Starkey we actually have a uh, resident um, white-tailed deer population um, they've been a small population size historically, but they're definitely increasing in size and also expanding their range inside Starkey. And so part of our work at Starkey is to 
Uh, we incidentally capture female white-tailed deer as part of our winter attempts to capture female uh, mule deer. So we're now putting collars on those white-tailed deer, and we are trying to explicitly bring in white-tailed deer as part of this issue of um, ungulate uh, behavioral interactions and, and understanding uh, with this expanding uh, white-tailed deer population whether that also might be contributing to uh, any negative effects on, on mule deer. Great, thank you very much. At this point, we've run out of questions in the question box, and so what I'm going to do is unmute the lines, and we still have over 80 people still on the line at this point, and so uh, we're gonna, uh, I'll ask for questions, and uh, we will do our best to try to get through as many questions as we can in the min minutes remaining. So hold on one second, and I'm going to unmute the The conference the lines. has been unmuted. Recognizing that we may have some extraneous background noise, but I see that John Pierce has his hand raised. John, did you have a question? Uh, not really. I guess I didn't know my hand was raised, but uh, I'm just uh, kind of listening in. And, and um, one thing I do plan on following up with is getting a hold of you guys and, and maybe starting with Mike about, and I don't know if you've heard of the predator prey study that we're starting up in Northeast that has a lot of similarities and um, looking for ways that we might be able to, uh, you know, work effectively in collaboration. Sounds great, John. Love to talk. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions, additional questions for the speakers? Yeah, this is uh, Adam Grove, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, I don't know. Would, would you guys be able to capture with your research? Obviously, there's the potential that with the current high elk numbers, that's uh, potentially helping to maintain higher predator levels in that area. Um, if you reduce elk numbers, there's the potential for prey switching. Uh, by the predators and the mule deer, will you be able to capture that sort of information? This is Darren again. Um, we've had a lot of internal discussions about that, um, and we will be monitoring, um, doing some diet work, uh, mostly through not a big sampling of scat, um, so we could probably pick up on some broader shifts. Um, we aren't doing the intensive labor work of, you know, monitoring clusters and seeing what the carnivores are killing, but we will have the uh, cost of the mortality information for all the collars. Um, but we've had lots of interesting debates on whether we're going to cause a predator pit scenario inside the fence, um, or deer or elk, um, for that matter. Um, so we are going to monitor that, um, but Anybody else have any thoughts on that side? Uh, I guess we all have our own hypotheses about that, but that's a, a real possibility. Um, and, and I think, I mean, Darren's right. We're we're in position to be able to monitor that those effects quite well. So I guess that's that's the reason for doing the research to learn about these things. Right. And we do know from telemetry data on the predators that they are, you know, moving back and forth <coughs> across the fence, and so um, you know, it's sort of an open population. So, but yeah. This, we don't know what's going to happen exactly. Great. Thank you, Adam. Any further questions from anyone on the line? Great. Well, uh, hearing no further questions, we'll give you one last opportunity for questions, but uh, please feel free to either raise your hand or just shout out if you have any additional questions. Otherwise, we will wrap up our webinar. All right, well, thank you all very much for participating in this terrific webinar today. And uh, especially want to thank Mike, Darren, and Mary, or actually Darren, for sharing this information with us. And uh, from the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, we're delighted to have such a great crowd today on this very uh, timely and relevant topic. 
And but before we go, I'd like to turn it over to our partner, Monica Thomasy at U.S. Forest Service, for some concluding remarks. Monica. Thank you. Thanks, Darren, Mary, and Mike, for this great information on mule deer. If anyone listening now has a particular wildlife or natural resource topic of interest you'd like us to cover, please send a request to Jonathan Mosley. Our next webinar will be, will be on institutional animal care and use committees. If you have any specific questions regarding this topic, please send them to Jonathan. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Don't screw it around. Great. Thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.